book tube. I thought, well, I have the camera up. I might as well do a mail haul. <laughs> let's let's see what we have this time around. Uh, let's start off with this one from I think Copper Collins. Uh, have you here? I'll just. Oh, it's a thriller. <laughs> All right, we're starting with a thriller. It has a banner on the on the ARC. The banner says, "You aren't going to like me very much," but the book is "Lie to Me" by J. T. Ellison. Uh, I really, really wish that it weren't. Because there have been, I think, 70, maybe 80, maybe even 90 books in the last 30 years called Lie to Me. And I'd, I'd really rather that the author came up with some other title. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a thriller with uh, a rain on a window shield in front of a federal building. I kind of like the look of it. Uh, don't know what they'll do with the banner, with the wraparound in the finished copy. Uh, but uh, let's see here. Uh, Lie to Me is very much a departure for J.T. Ellison. After nearly two decades of success, the New York Times bestselling author of more than 15 books and co-author of the popular A Brit in the FBI series with Catherine Coulter decided she needed a change. With Lie to Me, Ellison leaves behind, molds, leaves behind the mold of police procedurals and, for now, her beloved characters. Uh, hmm... For a new literary life in the arena of domestic noir. Sutton and Ethan Montclair's idyllic life is not as it appears. Though they seem outwardly to be made for each other, inside lies an ugly truth. Professional jealousy, personal betrayal, brute physicality, lies, and sometimes even outright hate are all, all abound behind closed doors. Sounds like my second and fifth marriage to Deb. <laughs> One day, Sutton disappears, leaving a note saying not to look for her. Uh, as the police investigate, Ethan quickly becomes a target, and all the lies the Montclairs have been spinning for years quickly begin to unravel. Hmm. Okay, so it's a, it's, I, I, I always love that when authors decide they're going to try something new. So uh, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in favor of it. Oh, did I say when this comes out? I think we have a good long time. Yeah, this is September. Uh... This comes out in September. So let's see here. What is the next one? Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> starts off with a packing list. I've mentioned before, uh, I've mentioned before on this channel that, that uh, I have, you know, the, 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 the familiar nightmare that a lot of you have when you're younger, that you're late for school and you show up in your school in your, in the, your classroom and you don't have pants on. Uh, I, the version that I have of that is that I get a packing list and I actually owe the amount that's on it. <laughs> It'd be something like $250 every single day <laughs> if I did that. Uh, but let's see. Let's see what we have here. Uh, this is from the University of Chicago Press uh, and it is due in late April and it's called The Machine in the Ghost, Digitality and Its Consequences by Robin Boast. Uh, who's a professor of, cul of cultural information science at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, we live in a digital age, buy and sell in a digital economy, and consume, oh do we consume, digital media. The digital lies at the heart of our contemporary information-heavy media-saturated lives, and although we may talk about the digital as a cultural phenomenon, the thing itself, digitality, is often hidden to us a technology that someone else has invented and that lives buried inside our computers, tablets, and smartphones. In this book, Robin Bose follows the video streams and social media posts to their headwaters in order to ask, what exactly is the digital? Hmm. Okay. Uh, I kind of like the sound of that. It doesn't sound quite so chicken little as a lot of these, uh, oh my God, what are we doing with all this smart technology books tend to be. Uh, I, the, there's a little bit of a straw man that set up there in the beginning uh, that we, you know, in our media heavy saturated age, we don't understand the technology that we use. We've never understood the technology that we used. Uh, we've used it anyway all along. Uh, but uh, in this case, I suppose it's more it's more ubiquitous. Uh, the machine in the ghost. Hmm. That does sound good. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna do, the author is going to figure out 
you know, how these things happen. I hope, I hope that that's what's going to happen. I, I admit, I often wonder. Uh, when I send, a, when I'm working on one MacBook and I send, I, I have a document and I know I'm going to want it on the other MacBook. I don't have Dropbox or anything like that. So I mail it, I email it to myself and I hit send on the MacBook Air and I've got the MacBook Pro open in front of me and it's not instantaneous. There's a second or two before it shows up in the inbox of the MacBook Pro and I often think, where did that information go in between then and now? It went a long way from here, I know. It didn't stay in Boston. Uh, and and how did it go there? How did it stay discreet as itself? When I get that back in the inbox of my MacBook Pro, how is it not mucked up six different ways? How is it not something else entirely? That's... <laughs> same thing when I'm when I'm watching uh, Facebook or Twitter and I see that somebody's embedded a video I just tap the video and it starts playing how does that work how does that happen <laughs> maybe this book will answer some of those questions that would be great I hope I can follow <laughs> uh, let's see what this next one is here uh, it's a thick heavy thing from Princeton uh, the happiness philosophers the Lives and Works of Great Utilitarians. Oh, my God. Jeremy Bentham. That's what we're going to get here. <laughs> oh, God. All right, so this is due in late May. Utilitarianism takes happiness as the ultimate normative standard. It may be most often associated with Jeremy Bentham's assertion that it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. But the tradition is often cast retrospectively as simplistic or even sinister, the origin of Dickensian villains, an imperialist ideology, or the panoptic surveillance state. Uh, the author of this book, Bart Schultz, reappraises the history and legacy of utilitarianism, paying close attention to issues of race and gender to argue that its founding figures, Bentham, William Godwin, uh, Henry Sedgwick, John Stuart, and Harriet Taylor Mill, were multifaceted critical thinkers who together had a profound influence on 19th century social reforms. Okay, all right, so this comes out in late May. It's, it's, uh, oh, God, help us. The type is tiny, and it's enormous. It's, uh, okay, so. An intellectual history of utilitarianism. Hmm. Not sure how that's going to play in Peoria. <laughs> I know for sure I can tell just, just by uh, glancing at it that no editor is going to pay me to review it. <laughs> so uh, if I review it at all, it will be for Open Letters Monthly. But that's still a distinct possibility. We'll see what kind of a job the writer does. Uh, and then we've got, we'll move on here. This is Harvard University Press. This is The Dawn of Christianity by Robert Knapp. People and gods in a time of magic and miracles. Hmm. Ordinary people of antiquity interacted with the supernatural through a mosaic of beliefs and rituals, exploring everyday life from 200 BCE to the end of the first century CE. Robert Knapp shows that Jews and polytheists lived with the gods in very similar ways. Traditional interactions provided stability even in times of crisis, while changing a relationship risked catastrophe for the individual, his family, and his community. However, people in both traditions did at times leave behind their long-honored rights to try something new. The dawn of Christianity reveals why some people in Judea, and then in Roman and Greek worlds, embraced a new approach to the forces and powers in their daily lives. Home. Okay. Uh, hmm. In time, a receptive and prophetic message and supernatural interventions, Jesus of Nazareth convinced people to change their beliefs by showing through miracles his direct connection to godlike power. Huh. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is due in August. This is it's striking me as another book that I will argue with. <laughs> uh, an old an old friend of mine used to point out uh, once the wine had been flowing that uh, Jesus' miracles in the New Testament don't change people's beliefs. Remarkably, they don't. <laughs> and, and 
and so that cannot be the purpose of them. And, and, and the subject is fascinating on its own. I also never understood why uh, Christianity is called monotheism. I really never have understood that, even even when I wasn't questioning Christianity. I still didn't understand that at all. Christianity has at least three gods. And I would argue that it has thousands of them. What is a saint? What is an angel? They're gods. Aren't they? <laughs> They're immortal. They live on Olympus. They have supernatural powers that can affect the world. They can read your mind. They can read your heart. How, how, how are they not gods? <laughs> I've never understood that. I've never understood that the way that Christianity successfully made that distinction where they don't have three gods. They have one god who's three gods, but it's not polytheism. And the saints and angels don't count. <laughs> I don't get that at all. Uh, anyway, I assure you, uh, if I had the powers of an angel, I would call myself a god. <laughs> and I would make all the rest of you call me a god as well. Those of you who still don't, that is. <laughs> all right, let's, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> bad enough I'm in trouble with all sorts of different demographics on YouTube. I don't want any trouble with the Vatican. <laughs> All right, so this one comes out in July, and it is The Netanyahu Years by Ben Caspit. It's a translation of his, his big book on, uh, on Netanyahu and his long tenure as Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is currently serving his fourth term in, in office as Prime Minister of Israel, the longest-serving Prime Minister in the country's history. Now, Israeli journalist Ben Caspit puts Netanyahu's life under the magnifying glass, focusing on his last two terms in office. Uh, <laughs> the tagline on the book says, A portrait of the current Israeli prime minister, one of Israel's more noticeable leaders in recent decades. <laughs> I think noticeable is just about the tamest adjective you could use for Netanyahu. <laughs> I have noticed him once or twice. <laughs> I got him in the kitchen just the other day making a sandwich. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's see, let's see what this next one is. It's small, so it's probably a, a slim volume of poetry. No mail hall be complete without. Oh no, no, it's not. It's and not only is it not a slim volume of poetry, but it's a, it's a double of something that I originally mistook for a slim volume of poetry. It's this thing, the back of beyond by Peter Stam. And it's it's not a finished copy. It's just another review copy. Uh, uh, about a, a, a thriller that uh, was translated from the German, I think, was it years ago? Uh, no, 2016. So it's a, it's a contemporary thing. Uh, it's just, huh, I wonder why I got a second copy. Well, anyway, uh, we'll move on to this last one. It's big. It's not a box, but it's big. Uh, let's see what we have here. Big is good. Big could be uh, a Steve book to end on. Should be nice. Oh, <laughs> All right, well, this is this is a little late uh, getting to me, but look at that. No, it's it's a uh, most welcome. It's the new Robin Hobb, uh, Assassin's Fate. Wow, this is book three of the Fitz and the Fool trilogy. Uh, wow, look at our, our hero has aged. <laughs> he's he's got a weathered look about him. This is a big thing too. Very nice. Uh, all right, so well, what what do we have here? Uh, I rather like this series, uh, so I'm very happy to have this book. Uh, more than 20 years ago, the first epic fantasy novel featuring Fitz Chivalry Farseer and his mysterious, often maddening friend, The Fool, struck like a bolt of brilliant lightning, as opposed to dim lightning. <laughs> now New York Times bestselling author Robin Hobb brings to a momentous close the third trilogy featuring these beloved characters in a novel of unsurpassed artistry that is sure to endure as one of the great masterworks of the genre. Okay. Have a suspicion. Could be wrong. I have a suspicion that Mrs. Dalloway's artistry probably surpasses that of Assassin's Faith. <laughs> I could be wrong. You never know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this, this comes out in, uh, in early May. Wow, a big fantasy epic. Fantastic. I wonder if I remember the earlier books well enough to just dig right into this. Of course, I often use that as a litmus test, uh, masochist that I am. I often say, 
I wonder if I remember the earlier book well enough to dig right into this. And then I think, well, that's the author's job. That's not my job. There's been a long time between books. It's a long and complicated series. I presume Robin Hobb wants new readers with every book. So it's up to Robin Hobb. Will I get the book or won't I? <laughs> so I, I might just do that rather than hunt around for any earlier volumes. So, but anyway, we're going to wrap up for now. So we have a, a big fat fantasy novel. That's nice. And then uh, The Back of Beyond, uh, copy number two. Then The Netanyahu Years, that, that, that very noticeable politician. And then The Dawn of Christianity. Uh, interesting. Uh, I'll, people trying something new in the Mediterranean. I don't think that's what they were doing, but I can't wait. It's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, the Happiness Philosophers, about the history of utilitarianism. You philosophy buffs out there. Uh, the Machine and the Ghost, which I have to admit is intriguing me the most of this batch, uh, about how our, our all surrounding digital, the, the tech, works. How it actually does the miracles that it does. that That's very tempting. Uh, and uh, Lie to Me by J.T. Ellison. A departure into what sounds like uh, the realm of a uh, gritty thriller. Uh, which is a little bit different than what she's done. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, but I think The Machine and the Ghost is first for me. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's, that's our mail hall for now. And I'll see you soon, BookTube. Thank you.